Hello. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Hadas Tier. I'm joining you here from my professional studio in the basement of my house. Uh, you'll have to excuse the weird lighting and sheet. Um, I want to welcome you to our virtual event, Microbes and Macroeconomics, Understanding the Pandemic and the Global Slump. Um, I'm the author of A People's Guide to Capitalism, an introduction to Marxist economics, which is uh, published by Haymarket. It'll be out later this spring. I'm really pleased to be joining you all today uh, and excited to be spending some time with David McNally, one of the clearest and sharpest radical economists that I know. Um, and I'll introduce David in, in a minute. Before I do, I just want to thank the sponsor of this event, Haymarket Books. Now more than ever, we really need radical independent presses such as Haymarket to understand the world in order to change it. Um, independent presses are, of course, under a lot of um, economic pressure right now. So this is a really good time to visit their website and buy radical books, um, which you can read while you're at home. Um, and you can also donate to support their ongoing publishing work and events like this one uh, with you Venmo Haymarket Books. Um, Haymarket is producing a whole series of really fantastic events. Hopefully you've seen some of them that have, have already happened um, using this time of pandemic and social distancing to find other organizing uh, means uh, like, like this. Um, we need sharp, clear analysis and we need discussion with each other. Uh, and even though we're looking forward to gathering again in person in the future for the time being, uh, these online events have really done a tremendous service. So I want to thank Haymarket again for that. And you can find all their previous and future events on their website. Um, and make sure to check out the incredible May Day lineup that they have coming up with uh, leading labor movement voices like Stacey David Gates, Sarah Nelson, uh, Sarah Jaffe, as well as an exciting poetry reading hosted by Aja Monet. Uh, both of these events are taking place on May 1st. You can find the links in the chat and you can also find more information at Haymarket's event right, Eventbrite page. Um, okay, a last bit of housekeeping before I kick it off to David. Um, if your stream gets choppy at any point, you might want to try reducing your image quality. Um, this video is also going to be recorded and shared afterwards on Haymarket Books' YouTube channel. Um, you're, and uh, we're reserving time for Q&A, um, so please post your questions in the live video feed while, uh, whenever you're watching, and uh, they'll, they'll be collated there. So let's get started. I'm excited to be joined in this conversation by David McNally. Uh, David is the Cullen Distin Distinguished Professor of History and Business um, at the University of Houston. He's an editor of Spectre Journal. Uh, he's the author of seven books, including Global Slump, Monsters of the Market, and now most recently, Blood and Money, uh, which is available and on sale at Haymarket. Um, Blood and Money goes through, a, you know, the sordid history of money and finance, its relationship to colonialism, slavery, and war. Uh, David's writings are my go-tos when I want to really get my head around the details of economic history and the current conjuncture, uh, but also to be able to understand them within a broader framework and how, of how the system works. Uh, so I highly, highly recommend picking up his books. Um, our Canadian viewers can also pick up Blood and Money from our friends at Fernwood Press. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to David for some opening remarks. After his remarks, he and I will kick off a discussion for a bit. And then we'll have time for questions from all of you. So uh, thank you, David. Wonderful. Thank you, Hadas, for those very generous words. And big props to Haymarket for this and the many other events that they're doing, which allow us to keep the spirit of radical education uh, and organizing alive during the pandemic. I'm going to start really the way that the title does, that is to say, with the microbes and proceed pretty quickly to the macroeconomics. But it's always worth saying, especially because of so much of the discourse that's around right now, that what we're experiencing is not a mere fact of nature. Of course, it has natural environmental foundations. There are bases in human biology and the natural environment which make a virus possible, for instance. But the way in which each and every one of us experiences this virus and this pandemic has to do with the social body of which we are a part, and of course of the body politic, that is to say the organization of political life 
through which we experience it all. And it's crucial to insist on this because as really important radical evolutionary biologists like Rob Wallace have pointed out, these pandemics are becoming more and more a fact of life in late capitalism. And this has to do with the destruction of the natural environment, with deforestation, with the growth of mega agriculture, with the speeding up of animal and livestock production cycles that make virulent pathogens that are highly transmittable, uh, more and more frequent and more common. So even that element of the pandemic has deep roots in our social organization. In addition, as Kim Moody's pointed out, the circuits of the pandemic have traced the circuits of global production and distribution chains. That's the way it's spread. You can map its transmission as Moody has done, and you can see that it's precisely the globalized structures of production and distribution that it is circuited through. The other th point I want to make in this regard is that we live in privatized capitalist big pharma. And as a result, all of our medical and scientific research and pharmacology is devoted to the bottom line. So they don't work on antivirals. They don't work on mass distribution of vaccines and so on, because that's not where capitalist pharmacology finds its markets. And I want to remind you that a pandemic such as this, as disruptive as it is, and as disorienting as it has been, is not a surprise to anybody in the higher echelons of the state. They have had intelligence briefings for over a decade, saying that it was simply a question of time before one of these viruses took on pandemic dimensions. And so let me just share with you the cover of a Time magazine from May of 2017 that perfectly illustrates the point. Here we have an image three years ago warning that there's a pandemic coming. We may not know exactly which one it's going to be, but it is inevitable that it will happen. And it looks like the United States, just like every other capitalist power in the world, is utterly unprepared for it. And of course, they're unprepared because the purpose of our social system, the mode of producing life in which we live, is the accumulation of capital by means of the production of profit. And that, of course, I've mentioned in terms of pharmacology, but let me just point out to you a few other highly illustrative points. Since the Great Recession of 2008-9, the number of public health workers in the United States has been cut by 20%. More than 50,000 public health care jobs have disappeared since the global recession of 2008-9. That looked at it from another angle. About $300 million has been cut from public health budgets in the U.S. over that period of time. So the United States today spends $2 per person on public health, the wealthiest nation in the world. And it is literally a pittance, little bit of spare change per person dedicated to public health. Things look utterly catastrophic when we turn to the global south. Coming into this pandemic, 48 nations in the world were spending more on their debt to foreign lenders than they were on their public health care systems. All right. In other words, foreign banks, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank were getting more of their social wealth than the health care systems they had for their people. In a country like Haiti, there are 
probably something around 50 or 60 ICU beds in the entire country. There are said to be 64 ventilators in Haiti, and doctors on the ground suggest that they'll be lucky if half of them work. If the pandemic takes hold, Haitian medical experts are saying that they will probably lose 800,000 people to it. Now, maybe it won't take hold in Haiti in a big way, but every precondition is there. Lack of adequate sanitation, high poverty rates, inadequate medical infrastructures, and so on. And so you then compound that with what has been happening in the last few months. For instance, since late January, $100 billion in capital has fled the global south. Because what's happening is that global investors are fleeing to safe havens. What that means is it robs all kinds of local economies of a certain amount of wealth that was circulating through them. In addition, migrant workers in the global north are now impaired in their capacity to send remittances from their wages back to their home countries. As a result, an article in the Financial Times this week suggested that 29 million people are being thrown into poverty in Latin America alone right now. So these are all the reasons that I want to insist that the pandemic is as much about a virus in the social body as it is a natural biological phenomenon. And we've got debt crises that are unfolding already for Ecuador, for Zambia, for Lebanon, for Argentina. We're seeing essentially all of sub-Saharan Africa once more being pushed onto the edge of debt crises. And that's one of the reasons why for the left, the demand for a global debt jubilee has to be at the top of our agenda. Here in the United States, when we argue rightly for the canceling of student debt, for the canceling of rent, and so on, and we should be arguing for all of that, but we cannot forget that the cancellation of all global debts owed by nations in the global south has to be part of this. All of the picture I'm painting is, of course, dramatically compounded by the structures of racial oppression and racial inequality. We know that the pandemic is hitting African Americans, Latinx people, and indigenous peoples two to three, sometimes four times harder than the rest of the population. The Navajo Nation in, here in the US, for instance, is fighting a rear guard battle against an absolutely raging pandemic in the midst of poverty, lack of sanitation, and clean running water. So if anything, what we're living through really underscores Ruth Wilson Gilmore's profound claim that racism specifically is the state-sanctioned production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. In other words, vul vulnerability to premature death is a key definitive characteristic of racism and racial oppression. And we're seeing that uh, in the most powerfully dramatic and frightening of terms right now as this pandemic spreads. From there, let me shift gears a little bit to the domain of macroeconomics. Because once again, in the mainstream, and particularly from White House commentators and the like, we're getting the claim that, yep, this downturn in the economy is bad, but it's going to be V-shaped, by which they mean it's going to go down sharply, and then as soon as we get the pandemic under control, it's going to bounce right back up. So it's going to look like a V, and that's part of their cheerleading chorus to keep capitalist spirits up. And maybe if it was just a result of the pandemic, perhaps there'd be some validity to this. But of course, that's not the reality. 
the world economy was already in the early stages of a new recession when the pandemic hit. And we can see this in all kinds of ways. I'm just going to share with you a few indicators of how we know that this economy was not resilient, that it was already heading into a new recession. In October of last year, October 2019, industrial profits in China fell by 10%. Industrial output in Germany fell by more than 5%. Canada had back-to-back -back months of job loss in October and November. And in the United States, business investment had declined for nine straight months. So I give you that just to highlight that this was an economy already entering into a new capitalist recession. It was working out the dynamics that had been set in play in 2008 and 9, to which I'll come back to in a moment. The other big indicator we have is that the Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. was massively intervening in financial markets as early as last September and October. At that point, it saw so-called stress in financial markets. Now, stress is really simple. It means that there are some institutions out there, banks, different kinds of mutual fund organizations and the like that cannot pay their debts. And so the Federal Reserve Bank comes in to, bank stop the, to backstop the system to make sure that nobody goes broke. And so this was all happening, as I say, last fall. Much of this has its roots in the way in which intervention by central banks the world over helped pull the global economy out of the great slump of 2008 and 9. Because it's true that when world financial markets went into meltdown, and I want to remind you, in 2008 and 9, all five investment banks on Wall Street went broke. Every single one of them collapsed effectively in 2008 and 9, but they were bailed out. They were bailed out at public expense by the Federal Reserve, the central bank in the United States. And the same thing happened in Italy and France and England and so on. Throughout all the core capitalist nations, central banks coordinated the most massive rescue operation of the global banking system in, in world history. And they did probably prevent a 1930s style crash when they did that. And so at one level, they saved their system. But the problem is that that kind of financial intervention blocked capitalism's own inherent recovery mechanisms. And what I mean by that is that Capitalism to stay vigorous needs brutal slumps and depressions because they've gotten into a crisis because they've over accumulated capital. They have more factories and can be used profitably, more machines, more shopping malls, more mines, more oil exploration and drilling operations than can possibly be used, more super tankers circuiting the globe, more warehouses and distribution centers than they can profitably use. That's over accumulation. And when it happens, because each capitalist is investing randomly on their own, trying to get the edge over their competitors, as they over accumulate the rate of profit, the return on investment goes down. And so as a result, a classic recession or depression drives out the least profitable and the least productive capitalists. It allows those who've survived to restructure and reorganize and eventually to start to invest again because they've got larger market share. However, by intervening massively to preserve the banking system, as they did in 2008 and 9, the world's central banks throughout the capitalist core nations essentially prevented bankruptcies and restructuring. That means several things. First, according to pretty good measures, something close to 16% of all companies that have been operating in the US 
over the last 10 years are so-called zombie companies. That is to say, they're not profitable. They are not, in capitalistic terms, successful companies. But because there's free money available from the central bank, they've been able to borrow to stay alive. And that's meant, as I said, it blocked bankruptcies, it blocked large-scale capitalist restructuring, and so on. So the so-called recovery since the Great Recession of 2008-9 is the slowest on record in the post-World War II period. Growth rates in Europe were around 1 to 1.5%. In the United States, they're around 2 to 2.5%. And we would typically expect growth rates of 5 and 8 and in the most dynamic sectors, even 10%. So what we had was a low growth, low wage, so-called recovery that had essentially been backstopped by central banks, but it went along with another stock market bubble because if central banks were making money readily available and capitalists weren't investing because there'd been no restructuring and no opportunities for considerable new investment, then they just played with the money. They speculated in stock markets. So we got a low investment, low growth, low wage recovery with terrific financial profits for those who were able to speculate. And many of you will recognize that picture I've drawn as what we've been living through for the last decade or so. The recovery, the very anemic recovery from the recession of 2008-9 started to turn down in 2016. And that's when Trump massively cut corporate taxes. That gave a temporary boost to profits. And that boost was itself winding down in 2019 in all the ways I was describing earlier, when all of a sudden two more shocks hit. And I want to remind you that it's not just the shock of the pandemic, which I'm going to come back to in a moment. Because in much of the global north, the shock of the pandemic was preceded by an oil shock. It's really important to underline this. Oil price globally has been artificially sustained since 2016 by production quotas that were worked out between all the main oil producers. And that allowed them to keep prices artificially high. It meant that all kinds of production of oil like oil sands and Permian Basin oil production and so on were profitable because the price was propped up artificially. But as the economy was winding down in 2019, the price of oil started to slide. As we entered early 2020, Saudi Arabia went to the other oil producing nations and said, hey, our prices are falling let's cut production further in order to try to generate scarcity rather than oversupply and see if we can stabilize the price. But remember, they said this in a world of capitalist rivalries and competition. And Russia said no. Russia said, these high prices just help the US and its oil industry. We're not going along. We're not going to cut production. At which point Saudi Arabia said, fine, then we'll actually boost production and flood the market because we can produce oil more cheaply than anyone else in the world. And due to this rivalry in the early days of the slump, oil prices started to crash and so did oil stocks. And so we were getting a stock market crash and an oil price crash before the pandemic had really significantly moved out of South, A East A South Asia and East Asia. And that was producing a stock market crisis that the Federal Reserve was already dealing with. And then, boom, the next great shock, that of the pandemic, hits late January into February of this year. That hit from the pandemic, of course, has massively deepened and accelerated what was going to be a pretty rough recession in any case. And what I'm really trying to highlight for you 
is that we had a faltering capitalist economy with no resilience left that was hit first by an oil shock and then by a pandemic shock. The effects are clearly catastrophic. We just learned earlier today that the US economy in the first quarter of this year contracted by 4.8%. That's huge. That's a massive contraction. And keep in mind, there was still low level growth throughout January, February, even perhaps into early March. We'll see as we get all the data. But most dramatically, 26 and a half million workers were added to the unemployment lines in the course of four weeks. And you'll see on this image that is going up now how dramatic that job loss is and how dramatically it compares to previous ones. If you look at the earlier record from 1981-82, for instance, on the left-hand side of the chart, you'll see, okay, so what happens is job losses get pretty high. You're getting maybe a half, um, you know, 500,000 people or so um, a week. And that's a lot, half a million people a week losing their jobs. And it's going on week after week, month after month for a period of time. And millions of people lost their jobs in the 1980 to 82 recession. When you then go further to the right past to the year 2000, you'll see another bump up around 2008, 9 into 2010. But nothing compares on that chart with what you see on the far right. Those are astronomical figures in 2020. In the case of the Great Depression of the 1930s, it took three years for unemployment to reach 25%. Now, those figures that you're seeing on the right-hand side of the chart there, they're about 16.5% of the workforce in the United States, 26.5 million, as you can see. But pretty good studies suggest that probably something in the range of 14 million people have been unable even to file jobless claims over the last month. In other words, that the real figure is somewhere around 40 million U.S. workers thrown out of work in the course of this crisis. And that is August 1932 style numbers. That's about 25 percent of the workforce in the United States. So we are in a completely different scenario. We're looking at a capitalist recession, which has now been compounded by the crisis in the oil markets and mass rivalry, uh, followed by the horrific effects of the pandemic. We can't be sure how it's all going to play out, although I will go on the record here and predict it's not going to be V-shaped. Uh, there's not going to be a sharp and quick recovery. Whether it's a so-called Nike slash, where it comes up a little bit and but stays way lower than the original mark, whether it's a long-term U-shape, whether it looks a little bit like a W with the beginnings of a recovery, and then as soon as there's a second wave of the pandemic, it goes back down. I can't be sure, but I'll tell you it's not going to be V-shaped. There's not going to be a sharp bounce back. And the most intelligent of mainstream analysts are saying they don't see how there's anything resembling a recovery for at least three to four years. They simply can't fathom how that's going to happen. And one of the things they're really worried about in some quarters is that we might go into a deflationary spiral, one in which compression of wages and low demand and low investment actually start, leads us into price declines. And that's essentially the stagnation scenario at a very low level that Japan has been in for the last 20 years or so. And that's definitely a prospect that's out there. What we can say, and I think we can say with a lot of certainty, is that we're looking at multiple years of mass unemployment, lineups at food banks, battles over debts and evictions, 
hunger, the racially differentiated death regimes that I was describing, ongoing crises of care and social reproduction, both highly gendered with overwhelmingly women at the home trying to serve as a shock absorber, absorbers for a system that is collapsing in terms of basic care for people, and of course on the front lines of the healthcare system. And of course, as we know, so many of the frontline workers are workers of color who are massively exposed and susceptible to the spread of the pandemic. We're going to see austerity measures that are brought in by governments as they say, well, now that we kept the financial system alive, we're going to have to turn to tightening our belts. And of course, we know what programs they will turn on. They're not going to turn on the corporate handouts. They're not going to turn on the bailouts. They're going to turn on basic social services desperately needed by poor and working class people. And we've got to be prepared for sections of the right to try to mobilize, to use nativism, racism, anti-immigrant sentiment, misogyny, homo and transphobia, and so on, to suggest that their right-wing politics are the answer to a society in crisis and turmoil. But I want to close by spending just a couple of minutes suggesting to you that as challenging, sometimes frightening, as that picture might be, we on the left have some wind in our sails. And we shouldn't underestimate the capacity of the socialist left to take some very significant and meaningful steps forward in this moment of crisis. We have enormous tools at our disposal by way of navigating this kind of economic and political terrain. And we need to remind ourselves, and it's something that I really hope we can return to in the discussion, that the right will not be able to meaningfully address one circumstance after another where the socialist left is truly equipped. And by that I mean the right will not be building rent strikes. The right will not be building safety strikes at work. The right will not be helping workers organize unions. The right will not be blocking evictions. The right will not be fighting for environmental justice. It will not be campaigning for Medicare for all, which is I think going to reemerge as an absolutely signature front of battle over the next few years. There are all kinds of areas in which the social and political response of the left is capable of resonating very powerfully. And we've seen that already in all kinds of ways. Support for Medicare for all is rocketing again in one poll that we've seen after another, as is basic support for things like opening up luxury hotels to house homeless people as a way of slowing down the pandemic, opening up jails, detention centers, and prisons to get people out before the pandemic spreads, and so on. There are all kinds of areas in which left-wing demands are resonating and can continue to resonate just as left organizing. Organizing against racism, against evictions, building unemployed workers movements. These are all things that the left of the 1930s learned how to do. And as it learned to fight racism and to fight evictions, to organize the unemployed into actual unions of the unemployed and so on, it laid the groundwork for the great upsurge of the middle years of the 1930s, the mass strikes of 1934 that really turned the tide politically and allowed the left in the United States to grow in the tens of thousands in a way it hadn't in a very long time, and which laid the basis for the huge wave of sit-down strikes that resonated all across the U.S. and brought industrial unionism to the so-called unskilled, often immigrant, often worker of color proletariat of the assembly lines in auto, steel, rubber, uh, and so on. And today, we're coming at all of this on the tales of 
an enormous feminist insurgency globally. Me too. The international women's strikes. The huge feminist uprising in Chile last year. Uh, similar campaigns in Argentina and Poland. We're coming at it on the heels of the climate justice strikes where millions, predominantly young people, we're taking action in the streets, walking out of schools, and in some cases, on a smaller scale, out of workplaces. We're coming at it after truly mass strikes last year in places like Chile, Colombia, France, strike waves in Sudan, Lebanon, Iraq, Hong Kong. We were, I've, I've referred to this in an article in Spectre Journal as 2019 being the year of the return of the mass strike. And of course, in the United States, we also saw strikes of tens of thousands by teachers in Chicago and Los Angeles, strikes that were winning anti-racist and community demands, uh, as well as workplace demands. So I highlight all of that not to be Pollyannish. Not to suggest we don't have very difficult conditions and real challenges ahead of us, but there is already resistance. And none of those experiences of 2019 are lost. The best record we have is that over 150 wildcat strikes have taken place in the U.S. since March 1st. In other words, workers are organizing, they are resisting. We've seen housing occupations and rent strikes. So as much as we're moving into dangerous and challenging times. I think I want to underline that the socialist left has a vision. We have resources. We have histories that allow us to position ourselves as a meaningful force in this moment of crisis. The socialist left, I think, can grow again. So as dangerous and challenging as these times are, these are also times for us to look for inspiration in the struggles that are breaking out all around us because there are things we've been building on for years that potentially can be taken to a higher level at a moment where a lot of people get that under capitalism, their lives are not as important as corporate profit and they see that as fundamentally wrong. So let me stop there and turn it back over to Hadass. Great, thank you so much, David. That was incredibly useful and there's so much to chew on there. Uh, and I do wanna remind also our viewers that um, you can use the chat function on YouTube to enter in your questions and we'll have time uh, to, to go through some of those questions. So please do that. Um, to start things off, I just wanted to pick up a little bit on where David uh, left off about, it. you know, it's, it's impossible to predict the, the exact course of um, how, how things will play out economically, whether it's a, a, a Nike or a U or I, I don't remember all the different types of letters it could be. Um, but in any case, we don't know, you know, the biological course of the pandemic, how long it will take to play out how many rounds of it we'll have to suffer through, um, and any number of other uh, things that flow from that, the government's response, um, et cetera. Um, and then the shock to the system that David described, um, you know, the, the unprecedented spike in unemployment, the, the uh, supply chains being broken, demand cratering, um, that's just never happened before um, on this level. So it's really, it's really impossible to predict um, combined, um, like you said, David, with the uh, pre-existing weaknesses um, that have uh, had already existed before this shock um, or the double shock, as you as you as you said. Um, so you know, some economists are are um, kind of naive, not naively, but like cheerleading the um, the stock market and the uh, mm -hmm. and um, the state of the economy. Work predicting a quick rebound, obviously that's not gonna happen. Um, a few economists are starting to talk about the scale of the Great Depression. Um, and I, I wanted to see what your thoughts are, you know, given, um, you know, during the Great Recession, it really seemed like neoliberalism had, had failed, you know, that on its own terms, um, that, it was a, that it was a failure and that they'd have to find something else. And of course that, that wasn't the case. Neoliberalism came back with a vengeance. Um, so, W wondering what, where, where might the capitalists try to go from here? 
um, what are, you know, some of the, what's their pl possible uh, playbooks uh, and what, what does that mean for us? Yeah, th those are really great issues, Hadas, and I'll really just do my best to offer a couple of stabs at them. Starting with really your last point, I think one of the things that this crisis is going to remind us of is that neoliberalism is not a static thing. It's a configuration. It's a dynamic crystallization of certain kinds of policy programs and power relations. But it evolves, it adapts in relationship to its own challenges. And so at the heart of neoliberalism was the attempt to destroy union power as effectively as capital could and to cut social programs, to restructure the state so that market imperatives and market competition moved more centrally through the system and that the buffers that people had that protected them against the ravages of the market, of unemployment, of poverty, of hunger, of ill health, and so on, and the institutions that workers historically used for self-protection, unions, that all of that was weakened. But having said that, neoliberalism never meant the retreat of the state. The state was there powerfully repressing. Its military forces were there. Its police forces, its prison industrial complex, as it's been called, massively expanding. Its ability to regulate the financial sector in the interests of capital, none of that was weakened. So it was a class reorganization in favor of capital and away from the working class, and in particular from the most socially oppressed sections of the working class. Today, they're needing the state much more centrally. I mean, imagine using defense production arrangements to tell General Motors what it has to produce, for instance. In other words, that's an admission that the state is sometimes going to have to overrule the market in navigating through the pandemic. It does not mean for a moment that the fundamental market principles are not in play. It simply means that this is a necessary emergency measure from capital standpoint. I think we're going to see a lot of that. It certainly means that we are into a certain kind of financial Keynesianism, by which I mean so-called helicopter drops of money largely into the financial sector, and then a pittance into the hands of working class people and small business people, and so on. And it is a relative pittance that has been dropped by way of the $1,200 uh, checks that apparently most people still haven't even seen. Uh, and here we are, you know, well into the pandemic, we're about to head into May. So I think we're going to see a lot of ad hoc uh, adaptations and adjustments. But the truth is, the way the system takes shape over the coming months and years is going to depend more on resistance from below than it is planning from above. In other words, they've got their plans. We know what their playbook looks like. It's a new round of austerity. It's even more savage wage compression as they buffer and bail out the financial system. So we know that's their playbook. But it is yet to be determined how much they can get away with. And they don't know. They will test and retreat. That's why what happened in Vermont over the last week is so important, where the governor came out and said, okay, I'm going to close three out of the six state colleges and public protest, including a caravan, pushed back hard and the governor retreated. But they're going to keep testing the waters like that. And so I think we need to be clear that it's not that neoliberalism is necessarily over. It's that it will have to mutate again. It will have to evolve and reconfigure itself in terms of it, those fundamental priorities that I talked about. But they're not sure how much they can get away with. A new round of austerity may be capitalist logic. But at this moment, to start slashing public health, to start slashing food aid, 
to start slashing programs that provide meals at schools for children and so on, that may run into some resistance. And as a result, I think exactly where they go is going to be determined, at least in some significant measure, by us as by them. Great. Thank you, David. Yeah, I um, incredibly, hospitals are already laying people off because it's not profitable to fight coronavirus uh, or COVID. It's, it's more profitable to do um, procedures and surgeries, and those are on hold. Uh, and that's the sick, um, sick consequences of having a healthcare system that's based on, on profit. Um, and that the $1,200, uh, Steve Munich actually came out and said that that should last us for 10 weeks. Um, which is what happens when you have, you know, millionaires uh, running our financial system. They have no idea what $1,200 will get you. Um, so I, I, I wanted to um, see if we can expand a little bit on the oil shock that, that you brought mm -hmm. up, um, which I think is really important to point out that that, ha that preceded um, the, the shock of the pandemic. Um, and of course, now the shock of the pandemic has made it you know, many magnitudes of orders worse. Um, in some cases, it's a classic case of overproduction, um, that there's just, you know, the world is awash in, in oil and demand um, has not kept pace, but also there are some more extreme manifestations and geopolitical complications. Um, shale oil in the U.S. is, you know, particularly hard to mm -hmm. shut down and then restart. Um, and they have so, they're so indebted, they have so much debt to pay back that for both of those reasons, there's, they're, they're not very invested in, in shutting down, although, of course, now they, they have to. But um, I wanted to see if you could speak on a couple of those things about um, just the special role that oil plays in the global economy, why it's, um, you know, what the geopolitical complications are and how they are continuing to, why they continue to uh, uh, force oil production forward and, and have such a devastating impact on the economy, um, and also just the role of financial speculation um, in in that volatility mm -hmm. um, that that also plays a big role um, in oil's ups and downs. It does. It plays a huge role. So again, let me try to do some justice to it. But as you note, I mean, oil is a bedrock of what I think has rightly been called fossil capitalism. Uh, that's riffing off of Andreas Malm's title, Fossil Capital. And the move from coal to oil and natural gas is just a different kind of fossil capital that took place in the 20th century. Uh, so that it, oil has been a strategic resource, huge for military purposes. I mean, that's where it really was identified initially as a strategic resource, uh, was for, for military purposes. And it has become, as I say, a kind of bedrock of the whole system of production and distribution of capitalism for more than 100 years now. And it's therefore treated as a strategic resource. The United States, and particularly the Trump administration, has been huge on oil self-sufficiency, for instance in a period where forms of protectionism are becoming more distinctive in the rivalry between great powers in the world, not being reliant on anyone else for oil has become huge. And for that reason, the Americans were working with the Saudis to keep oil prices artificially high, up until fairly recently, as high as $70 a barrel, for instance, which makes the production that you see in the United States, for instance, shale oil production in Canada, oil sands and the tar sands, uh, though that kind of production, it makes it financially viable. When that price starts to crash below $50 and then below $30 and recently below $20 and even turning negative for a period of time, then what that means is that there's no financial viability to huge parts of global oil production outside of state support and state bailouts. And there's no question that the Trump administration is trying to figure out exactly what their bailout package is going to look like for the energy industry uh, and that sector, which is another reason 
of course, for us to be thinking very aggressively, not only around Medicare for all, but the kinds of demands we mobilize around the Green New Deal perspective. Because, look, if the oil industry can be bailed out, why cannot the same hundreds of millions go into solar and wind, for instance, into renewables on a mass scale? And that's the kind of green job creation programs that I think the left can be very credibly fighting for and organizing around. You also mentioned financial markets, and that's it's really important because when we were first told that the price of oil had turned negative, that is to say they would pay you to take oil, in fact, what you were being paid to take was a financial contract for oil. Uh, it's basically what's known as a derivative, a financial commodity, a financial instrument that's bought and sold. And it's in financial markets that the short-term price of oil is largely determined, even if it has underlying global market foundations. And speculation around oil prices is a huge industry in finance. It's a huge sector. Uh, as a result, the turmoil has also been, if you will, overdetermined, exaggerated and amplified by people who become so-called short sellers. In other words, people who start to bet that the price is going to fall. And once they start betting that it's going to fall, they bias the market in that direction. So there's no question that speculative activity in financial markets has deepened an inherent market slump in oil. And then we've got all the rivalries running through it. The final point I want to make here is no one should think that Trump's latest war threats to Iran are separate from the turmoil in oil markets. The Trump administration knows, like every U.S. administration, that if you threaten war towards Iran, the price of oil rises. It rises because the threat of turmoil in the Middle East, Iran, of course, is itself an oil producer, but the regional instability that that kind of military confrontation produces inevitably creates the fear that oil will turn into uh, short supply very quickly. And so, of course, the price did rally when Trump began to threaten war with Iran. So do not lose sight of the degree to which it was military posturing to help bail out the oil industry. But having said all of that, they're massively overproducing. The demand for oil globally has fallen by at least 30%. They've made production cuts about equal to about 10% of world output. So they're not even close to addressing it. And the reality is that as they move further and further down the road of production cuts, it puts the most expensive producers like the United States, like Canada, uh, in the crosshairs. And so the we've really got to pay attention to the ways in which the Trump administration in particular is going to try to protect big oil and big energy in this crisis. And it's going to be a really good point of intervention for us around the question of capitalist priorities and the alternative of green job creation programs that uh, we can and should be fighting for. Great, thank you, David. And um, I guess just along those lines too, I wanted to see if you could talk for a minute too about the role that this, you know, you touched on uh, some of the volatility in the Middle East so many of the economies in the Middle East are very reliant on oil production. Um, you know, certainly Saudi Arabia, but a number of others as well, where without profitability there, you know, what that means on the ground um, in terms of the political crisis and economic crisis. Um, and it's something that you spoke to in your opening remarks as well about um, the impact of the global South, because there's any number of countries from, you know, Nigeria to Ecuador, um, that are completely dependent on oil exports. Yes. Um, and so now they're getting, you know, hit uh, doubly by um, the, the um, economic crash, the pandemic, and um, an oil crash. Um, so if, um, if you could say uh, a few 
you thought any thoughts about that? Yes, it's going to be hugely destabilizing. And of course, really both regions that you mentioned, Tadas, are regions of huge popular insurgency over the last few years. I mean, we have had an, a, a new center of insurgency throughout parts of Latin America that have included Ecuador, which has been very, very hard hit by the pandemic already. Uh, and of course, the semi-insurrectionary mass strike uprisings in Colombia, also uh, an oil and mineral producer, and all of those commodity prices, prices by the way, it's oil's getting particularly savage, but all of those raw commodity producers, like those who are producing all kinds of other minerals, are going to be suffering hugely in, in this moment. So you've got a region in which the so-called lost decade since 2008, nine was already playing itself out and producing social turmoil from Chile to Colombia to Ecuador and so on. And then, of course, there were mass uprisings in Lebanon and Iraq already that I referred to. We saw big, big protest movements in Iran over the last 18 months or so. So these are socially volatile places that are now going to be savaged by what's happening to oil, natural gas, other mineral and commodity sectors. And I'm not surprised as a result that we've seen a resurgence of street protest in Lebanon over the last couple of days. And don't misunderstand me. Obviously, the safest thing is in terms of the pandemic is for people to stay out of the streets. But you can only stay at home if you can survive, if you're free of hunger. And what we're hearing from the protesters in Lebanon is entirely rational and sensible. We would rather die fighting back in the streets than dying of hunger by ourselves at home. That's how serious the turmoil and the crisis is. People cannot access foreign currency, for instance, but the ruling class of Lebanon has been shipping money out of the country so fast it makes us dizzy. And so the class inequalities there. Iraq has a very, very similar picture. I mean, that social insurgency where Tahrir Square in Baghdad was basically turned into a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week people's assembly of mass meetings, healthcare clinics, free public lending libraries, food provision, and so on prior to the pandemic. So I think what we're going to see is what we've already started to see in Lebanon, which is that some of these social movements are going to be back in the streets because social distancing is only viable if there is material means of support, if there are ways of feeding yourself in particular. And in those societies which are at the edge right now of literal social breakdown, I think we're going to see an explosion of social protest. And yes, watch those areas that are where all of this is compounded by the oil crisis, as you mentioned. Great. Um, and this is a good jumping off point, actually, to a couple of questions from our viewers. Um, and we do have a lot of questions, um, so I want to make sure we're leaving some time for that. Um, the first two I'll, I'll, I'll read together because I think they get at, um, some, some similar ideas. Uh, Zachary Levinson asks, uh, if government responses are largely articulated in national terms, how can we make demands on the state without reproducing this nationalism to the exclusion of other countries? What would a truly internationalist response look like? Uh, and uh, Billy Bob asks, what kind of financial intervention could help developing countries fight and recover from the virus. Okay, well, th those are both wonderful. Uh, let me start with Zach's point, because yes, it's true that in the first instance, our demands are always focused on national states. But for those of us in the global north who are honest about the histories of imperialism of our states 
there can be no serious political response from the left that isn't also anti-imperialist, that isn't also challenging the colonial and imperial logics of our own state machineries. And so uh, that's why I mentioned when we were talking about debt when in my opening remarks that a global debt jubilee, including canceling all the debts owed to American banks, to all banks in the global north, to the IMF and the World Bank, has to be part of our campaign. Going back to what I was saying about 48 countries spending more on their debt payments to global lenders than on their healthcare systems. Opening borders. You see, people kind of have this notion, well, you can't be letting people in because what if they have the virus? No, no, no. You can bring people in and you can properly and safely put them up in hotels, have them provided with medical services. There's no contrast between protecting our communities from the virus and opening the borders. There's no inherent conflict there. It's just a question of making the social resources available to do so safely. That to me is, is really uh, fundamental, that open borders is not negotiable at this point. And of course, we know what the human social cost of closing borders is right now in terms of uh, human suffering on, on a world scale. For those of us organizing in the US, it means opposing all of the sanctions re regimes that the American government has in place. Any sanction regime, whether it's Iran or Cuba or Venezuela, has got to be opposed and dropped. I mean, it is unconscionable that once again, basic medical goods can't get into uh, Iran right now. Similarly, of course, we extend our Palestinian solidarity. Stop the blockade of Gaza right now. Do not turn it into a center of the pandemic because that's what is inevitable uh, so long as the Israeli-driven and U.S.-backed blockade is in place. So I think there are lots of creative ways in which the left can put demands on the state for social provisioning, for Medicare for all, and so on, without losing its anti-imperialist commitments and its internationalist obligations. Uh, and that sort of takes me to, you know, a little bit more to that point around what kinds of interventions, because right now, the scale programmatically that we can address is really almost open-ended. That is to say, how's the homeless? I talked about the use of hotel rooms, which is happening in some cities. Open the detention centers, the jails and the prisons. Feed the hungry. I mean, any of us who are watching any kind of news programs know that even the mainstream news is saying what's going on when farmers are destroying food and we have lineups for hours at food banks and food distribution centers. It simply takes the use of government resources to move the food from the farms to the hungry. Totally possible. The logistics of it are not complicated. It involves things like trucks and human beings to load boxes and unload boxes. Uh, the logistics of it technologically are simple. How come we've heard no discussion in the US of what Spain did in the early days of the crisis, where it commandeered private healthcare facilities, took private hospitals and said, these are now in the public domain, subject to public regulation, and we're using them. Now, I would argue that should become irreversible. That should be part of a socialization program for the whole healthcare system. But you can see how on one front after another, food distribution and supply, healthcare provision, housing the homeless, opening the jails and detention centers, bringing about a whole series of campaigns to organize the unorganized, to encourage safety strikes by workers, and so on. The the fronts on which we can act now are multiple. 
And I think what we're going to find is it's not the socialist left that needs to be taking the lead. It's happening. Over 150 wildcat strikes, as I mentioned. Mothers in Los Angeles just taking over empty houses and so on. It's figuring out our role in linking these struggles together, helping them develop more robust general solidarities and reinforcing them with the resources, analysis, and feet on the ground uh, that we can bring. But I think there are huge fronts for intervention, and we're putting demands on the state, but wherever possible, we're putting demands on the state subject to as much direct involvement of working class people in the decision-making process as possible. And I'll finish on this point. Uh, Why, for instance, shouldn't nurses and other healthcare workers in New York be actually now designing the provision, the healthcare provisioning plans that are needed to confront the next waves of the pandemics, how resources will be distributed, what needs to be produced, how many people need to be trained in basic healthcare to expand the workforce and so on. There are a lot of things that we can do where there can be direct involvement of unions, community organizations, and so on that are part of putting these demands on the state so that we don't just let unaccountable bureaucracies do it all. Great. I um, I want to ask you one more question along these lines, and then I want to switch tacks a little bit. Um, Andrew B. asks uh, if you can speak more about international debt relief by what means can this debt be forgiven? How do we fight for them? And what would be the immediate effect? Right, that's that's great. And the actual mechanisms are not difficult. And, and Andrew, like everybody else should know that when a country is effectively bankrupt, it regularly goes into debt negotiations. And usually lenders are expected to take a so-called haircut. This was done with Greek debt. This has been done with debt throughout Latin America at times. So that debt is always renegotiable. But similarly, some countries have, even in recent memory, simply repudiated debts and refused to honor them. Argentina did it during the crisis of 2000 and 2001. They basically said, no, sorry, we're not paying them back. Other countries have said correctly that there's something called odious debt. Odious debt is when a military dictatorship builds up its military infrastructure by borrowing to pay for tanks and fighter aircraft and so on, Then eventually the people manage to overthrow the military dictatorship and global lenders say, yeah, but you still owe us those billions. Well, no, we are not responsible, say say the people, for the odious debts of our former dictators. And so we have had debt repudiation in the past and most recently Argentina has done it. What does it mean? It means that Huge global lending institutions, massive global financial institutions take a hit. I'm prepared to see that. I think most of our listeners are not troubled by the idea that global banks that have been parasitic on people and nations around the world might have to take billions of dollars in losses. Because after all, the truth is the people own the banking system by way of the bailouts that they've already done. It's the, the problem is it was never passed into public control. And yet public funds are repeatedly used to bail out the banking system. So let's bring that system under public ownership in a campaign that also says every economically and politically odious debt in the world is to be repudiated. And that's too bad for the billionaire shareholders of those banks who got wealthy off the suffering of people in Nigeria or Ecuador, wherever. Uh, But a global debt jubilee, that is to say a global debt repudiation, is actually entirely possible and plausible. And the only ones who will really lose 
are these massively wealthy lenders who never had a right to any of those payments in the first place. Great. Um, okay, I want to pair switch tax a little bit and pair another couple of questions for you um, on the issue of climate. Uh, Nicole Gonzalez asks, why does such a strong contraction not translate into a strong carbon emission contraction? What does this mean for the climate movement? What would it take to economically cut emissions? And Barbara Myers asks, do you think the oil crisis might have a good impact on investment into renewable energies? Yeah, again, terrific questions. And let's start with the carbon emissions because I think if anything has been dramatically underlined by what is really a, you know, a shockingly low decline in carbon emissions when we know that vehicular traffic, people driving their cars to and from work, for instance, has hugely declined. Airline traffic is almost in a complete collapse, for instance, and yet um, the, the truth is that the impact has been much less considerable than people imagined. And that's overwhelmingly because that global production and distribution supply chain that I was talking about earlier continues to tick over. And you cannot uh, deal with climate change at the level of individuals driving their cars less or taking fewer air flights or trying to adjust their individual consumption. We know that a majority of carbon emissions are attributable to about 150 mega corporations on the planet. And as a result, you have to address the central fundamental question of a transition away from a fossil fuel based energy system and nothing else except a massive decarbonization really gets us anywhere and starts to move us towards beginning to address global warming. A certain amount of global warming, as we know, is locked in, but there are still factors of reversibility that could be huge for the ecosystem, huge for an enormous amount of life on the planet. And as a result, the demands have to be much, much more radical right now. They've got to be about a systematic shift to decarbonization, the shutting down of the carbon-based fossil fuel industries. They've got to, that, that, that has to be the program. And that's why for sure, we're talking about massive social investment in solar and wind in particular, as we go through a decarbonization. I recognize we're talking about a transition that requires some years, but you could move very, very rapidly. Imagine, you know, the basic inspiration of the Green New Deal, even though, you know, I think some of the formulations of it were too modest, I think they needed to be more dynamic and more aggressive. But the basic idea is we have unemployed people and we have factories that could tomorrow be re-engineered to start producing solar panels. They're sitting there those factories and the workers with the skills to work them. You ask them, would you like to take this mothballed automobile factory and start producing solar panels? I think you'll get buy-in. I'm not worried about winning workers uh, over to the idea that employment in green production would be a good alternative. And so, yeah, I think the, we have to have on our agendas right now, really aggressive visions for decarbonization by way of green job creation programs, particularly in solar and wind, which imagine an accelerated transition away from fossil fuels. And as I say, we've got the examples right now. They're going to try to throw billions upon billions to saving the oil industry in the United States. No, no, no. It's time to say there are alternative uses of that, just as there are alternative uses uh, for the money that's going to be used to bail out financial, uh, the financial sector also. So thank you very much for, for those questions, because yes, I think the moment of oil crisis, 
the fact that the U.S. and North American industries aren't viable at current price levels, all of that does allow us to make probably the most compelling case in a very long time for decarbonization and green alternatives. Great. Um, okay, what was I going to ask you next? Had it in my head. Um, okay, so... Simon Pearson asks, will the pandemic see the end of the domination of the dollar? Probably not in the short run. And that simply got to do with the fact that the dollar is too entrenched as the primary reserve currency in the world right now. And it's still treated as a safe haven by investors globally. However, I don't want to completely dismiss the premise of Simon's question, because I think what we are seeing is an attempt by some nation states and some investors to diversify their monetary holdings. We're going to see the Chinese yuan or renminbi. Uh, we're going to see the Chinese currency continue to assume a bigger and bigger role in global markets. The European capitalism tried to position the euro to that end, and it had some limited successes prior to the last uh, global crisis. But clearly the Chinese won is advancing as such a currency. I don't believe it means a rapid decline of the dollar. I think things are simply too lopsided in the dollar's favor right now. But I do think, yes, we're in a scenario in which a growing diversification away from the dollar is happening, and one in which it could be imaginable that two or more reserve currencies would start to play quite significant roles in global markets. And by the way, that will bring greater pressure on the US dollar and US financial markets over time, because it will mean that investors have an alternative to parking in the dollar when they just want a safe haven. Great, and, and along those lines um, about China, somebody asks, uh, what about China that its economy is recovering? Yeah, and we'll see how robust and prolonged the Chinese recovery is. One of its complications is it was inevitable that Wuhan would start to bounce back. Just as I said to you, you know, it's possible that we're going to get a so-called W-shaped recovery where you do see it start to go back up, but then slump again, particularly if there are further waves of the pandemic, which is highly possible right now. Uh, so it was inevitable that as Wuhan came out of a kind of pandemic lockdown, that you'd see enhanced activity there. But China is, of course, central to global production chains. And if North America and Europe are in recession, it's going to have big impacts on the Chinese economy. There's no doubt that China is headed for lower growth. Now, for all kinds of reasons, for it, a growth slowdown doesn't have to be a negative growth period, a contraction of the sort that the United States has been going through, because China, over the last number of decades, has been growing usually around 8 to 10 percent, more recently around 6 to 7 percent a year. We may see a slowdown more like 2 percent, 3 percent growth, which is very challenging for the, the Chinese economy. But I think China's vulnerability as a link in the global supply chain is also going to be revealed. Having said that, the Chinese state is centralized, has significant capacities for itself, and has become more of a global player. China has been the largest investor in Africa now for quite some time. And sometimes it's simply been buying up land, essentially engaged in, in land grabs. Its so-called Belt and Road 
initiative has seen Italy sign on recently. So China is extending itself. It's becoming a more central lender on a global level as well. Also right now, more and more loans emanate from China. And so I do expect that the rivalry that we've been seeing, particularly under the Trump administration between the United States and China, will continue. And it's one of the reasons Trump wanted to go around using all of his racist terminology about the virus, for instance, to try to stoke anti-China sentiment. The kind of rivalries that were already in play before the pandemic are not lessening up right now. So yes, expect that China is going to try to continue to position itself not as a full-fledged rival yet to the United States, but as a player that is elbowing its way into greater global influence. I think we can safely say that's happening. Great, and another um, question about the global economy from Brian Donnelly. He asks, with a level of borrowing being needed and undertaken worldwide, isn't the whole global economy becoming a single zombie economy, dead but still moving? It's a really interesting metaphor, and I think there's, there is some truth to it, because we're, we're talking essentially about a system that would have had a 1930s-style collapse in 2008-9. When you read now the memoirs of the key financial officials in the United States, at the Treasury, at the Fed, and so on, they were not sure that they could rescue the global banking system in 2008-9. And what's interesting in terms of Brian's question is that we've, we've had that zombie economy phenomenon, but interestingly, what they did this time is that they didn't wait for the banks to collapse before they started bailing them out. We've had bailouts prior to collapses this time. It's a really interesting scenario. And of course, it's because they knew how much toxic rot there is in the system. There are all kinds of financial institutions that are not worth what's on their books, that have so-called toxic assets that will melt down without being backstopped by central banks. So the idea of a kind of global zombie economy, not entirely far-fetched, because it's one that is in terms of the financial system on life support. Having said that, there have been robust centers of capital accumulation, particularly in China, parts of India up until recently, but those have hit their own overaccumulation crises. And what is certainly true is that this system is avoiding a slide into an even worse global depression by way of financial life support. And that is going to mean a lot more zombie companies. I'm not sure, however, if in some sectors they can prevent waves of bankruptcies. It's hard for me to see how they do that in the oil industry, for instance. I mean, there are just some producers in global oil right now who are not going to be profitable in the next decade. What justifies anybody investing in them. So unless they're totally propped up by the state, I think there are sectors, airlines, tourism, oil, and other parts of the energy sector that are going down unless the system simply decides it's prepared to buy up everything. Interesting scenario. I'm not sure they have, they have the resources to do it. Um, so we have time for one more question with apologies to the many uh, fantastic questions that people have added that we don't have time to get to. Um, but I'll, I'll end with this last question about alternatives. Um, seems like a good place to end. Terry asks, my question is, what kind of alternative economy do you propose? Social democracy, old style socialism, communism? What do you think of donut economics? Okay, so let me start by saying that We've always got to unpack each and every one of these concepts and categories. So 
there's a sense in which I'm a pretty classical style Marxist when it comes to these questions. However, that can in and of itself be a fairly confusing statement because I'm a classic old style Marxist who actually doesn't believe that the former so-called socialist countries were anything of the sort. I don't think that the former Soviet Union was a socialist planned economy, for instance. My vision of socialism is of a democratically planned economy in which places of work are operated according to principles of workers' democracy and workers' control, and in which planning processes are driven from community and workplace levels to ever higher scales. And then there's a feedback mechanism from the higher scales to the lower scales. In other words, we break production for profit and we replace it by production for need. We then do that by way of enabling people in their communities and their workplaces to assess their needs for housing, food, health care, child care, cultural and recreational facilities, and so on, and then interfacing with other levels of a democratic planning process so that you have literally local, regional, so-called national, so long as nation states exist, and global levels in planning processes which are feeding information back and forth through democratic channels. So yeah, you would actually have, if you want to put it in these terms, a parliament of global workers' deputies that periodically meets uh, and brings planning information and so on back to lower levels and so f- and so on. But production for need, not for profit, under a system of democratic management, control, and planning in which neighborhoods, communities, workplaces are vigorous, active agents. And to me, that's a kind of classically Marxist perspective. It's what I associate with Marx, with Rosa Luxemburg, with the early years of the Russian Revolution, before its destruction, with some of the great socialist figures and traditions uh, that came later. And one of the interesting things is that as we have seen a rebirth of the socialist movement in the United States in recent years, I think that's also created an opening to break away from some of the models that dominated a past left and allow us to re-explore, update, and refine some of the models that have been around from earlier lefts with a number of really important kinds of modifications. Our socialism today has to be more feminist, anti-racist, pro-queer, internationalist, and eco-socialist for instance, than any earlier models that we had. That's just a reality of who we ought to be in late capitalism, who the global working class is, and what our commitments to opposing all kinds of oppression ought to be. But if you keep those notions of production for use, not for profit, democratic planning at multiple scales, and that commitment to internationalism, then I think you begin to see some of the outlines of what an alternative could look like. And I want to kind of come back finally to the point that I concluded my presentation on. This has been a period of resurgence and rebirth for left movements internationally and in the United States over the last number of years. We actually are in better shape in terms of a popular receptiveness to socialist ideas than we have been for a while. And now the challenge is on a very, very different terrain of mass unemployment and pandemic, but also of new modes of resistance, figuring out how we become centers of education, organizing and resistance so that a socialist working class movement becomes stronger 
over the coming years, not only in the ways in which it did in the 1930s, but also with some of those stronger commitments to anti-oppression and eco-socialism that I was describing. Great, thank you, David. That's a, a fantastic ending point for us. Um, is there, before we close it out, are there any final things that you wanna get to that uh, we didn't get to in this discussion um, before I close it out? Well, I definitely want to thank you, Hadas. It's been really a wonderful interchange and I thank you for your perceptive uh, and probing questions. That's been great to all of the listeners and uh, those who contributed questions. Uh, I, we, I should also remind the listeners that Hadas has a forthcoming very, very uh, important book on a people's guide to the ABCs of capitalism. Do watch for it because it's gonna be making the round soon. Uh, and thanks as always to my publisher, Haymarket Books. Haymarket is a beacon in this moment. And as someone who has worked with Haymarket on a couple of book projects now, and I hope on future ones also, they are the dream publisher of the left. And I'm hugely honored to, uh, to be privileged enough to work with them. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'll also end with my thanks as well. Um, thanks everyone uh, for for joining us out there, um, sheltering at home with good politics. Um, and uh, I do want to encourage people to share this video for uh, other folks that weren't able to make it. Uh, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I think there are hundreds of people tuning in um, and feel free to share it uh, more widely. For anyone who is in a position to, if you have stable income, of course, you can donate to Haymarket to make sure that the important and critical work that they're doing um, is able to thrive. Um, you can do so by via Venmo to Haymarket. Uh, you can also uh, follow Haymarket's YouTube channel um, uh, to see uh, for more events like this. Um, you can follow their social media and find me and David as well on social media on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, as David said, you can check out our books, of course, at Haymarket. Um, and, um, and, and, and just to end, thank you so much, David. That was incredibly uh, clear um, and, and hopeful in this uh, otherwise bleak time. Uh, so thank you, David. Thanks to all the people that are um, out here watching. And thank you to Haymarket Books. Thank you.